Each time I read Diane Francis, I think, well, why isn't she running things? She sees and she thinks and she speaks so clearly and with such certainty, knowing exactly what needs to be done, that I think, well, just let her get on with it. Um, here's an example of the way she writes. This is the end to a recent column about the environment and ongoing population growth, she writes. The point is that Copenhagen's talking points are beside the point. The only fix is if all countries drastically reduce their populations, clean up their messes, and impose mandatory conservation measures. That's it. As simple as that. Diane Francis. The death penalty. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, I'm going to uh, be simple again. Uh, that's what I do. I, I didn't know till about half an hour ago what I was going to talk about. Um, and I was deciding, uh, despite what he, he said, to talk about overpopulation. Something that really bothers me. I can talk about Wall Street and all the crooks and all that stuff. I write about it all the time. You can Google that. Uh, but I do want to talk about, and as a business writer so, and a business person, uh, I know a little bit about arithmetic. And this is the ultimate arithmetic problem. And it is overpopulation. A million babies are born a week. Add it up. 16,000 children die a horrible death of nutrition daily. We have dictators who pay or force women to procreate. We have religious authorities who force women to procreate. We have um, harems. We have all kinds of nasty ayatollahs out there who, when you vocalize this idea, jump all over you. And it's quite frightening, and I'll give you, give you my story. Just before Copenhagen, which turned out to be a bit of a zoo because there was too many people involved and it didn't end up doing anything, but just before Copenhagen, I wrote the beginning of that column and I said, the real inconvenient truth is overpopulation. It's not the only reason we have pollution and environmental degradation, but I think it's a pretty good reason. It's why the tigers are going to go. It's why the forests are going. It's why we have oil spills in the Gulf of Mexico, which, by the way, we're already being overfished and overshrimped and overpopulated and overpolluted by the cities on the beaches. It's going to turn into a gigantic sewer, as the rest of the oceans will. So I wrote this column, and I said, for example, the only country in the world, I found another one, by the way, Rwanda, strangely, and I'll talk about that, that has actually made it an economic development policy was China, the one-child policy. Gone on for a generation. And I wrote it. And I got lots of wonderful comments from people in Canada. I had 25 newspapers in Europe buy the column, which I thought was strange, and I'll explain why. And then it started. I have never been besieged. I mean, I, I started calling my email hate mail. I mean, three, four hundred emails threatening my life, being nasty, calling me a, euge uh, a, a eugenicist, a, a baby killer, a Nazi, because of an idea. This is the most hated idea in the world and it's probably the most rational and obvious. I had to have police involved. I never felt so horrible in my life and, I've had, and it went viral. It was on the front of the Drudge Report for a week. That brought all the Palin followers out, all the morons who follow her. <laughs> it brought out the Catholics. I was, an anti I, was, I was an abortionist because I said China, and somehow they, they thought that China forces women to have, no, China does not force abortion on women to get its one-child policy. Does abortion happen there? Yes, I think that's choice. I'm a choice girl. 
But the point is I had posses chasing me. I had the Catholics, I had the anti-abortion, I had the born-agains, I had every crazy religious wacko who thinks that women shouldn't control their uterus in the world chasing this column. It was bizarre. I had people hack into my website. I had my Wikipedia tainted and tampered with. And called, I was called names and, and all kinds of other libelous things. It really is one of the most shocking things and I think it's a female issue. I think that there's plenty of facts and it's intuitive that as education rates go up and religious oppression goes down, women have fewer children because guess what? It makes sense. But I am saying it makes sense for the planet. My column also made the front of the China Daily News in the days leading up to Copenhagen. And the Chinese did the numbers and threw it in everybody's face because it gave them a moral high ground, which I really believe it did unless they're forcing people to have abortions, which I don't understand that they're doing. They educate females and they provide birth control. So what, what I'm saying is that they, they said we have not had 400 million people born in 20 years because of our policy. So you're telling us that our coal plants are a problem? We're gonna be seven billion people shortly and 400 million more people by the year 2020. So you can't stop drilling for oil, you can't stop mining, you can't stop cutting down forests, and you can't stop the price of food going up to the point where 32,000 babies will die a, year of a day of malnutrition. So I find it really very, very disturbing and very obvious. When I went to the conference in Davos recently, I came across, I, I went to a, a, a session on population control. And, you know, it's, it's about offering choice to women. And uh, came across the only other government in the world that actually has a policy. It was the finance minister and the minister of economic development for Rwanda. And Rwanda is getting back on its feet after its nightmare of slaughter. But I thought it was really interesting that here we had something on population control in the world, and there was Planned Parenthood there, and there were other feminist women, and people like myself, and United Nations Secretary General, who's also involved in this. And here was this man who was the finance minister of a country. And he explained why. He said, population control has to be in my portfolio because the finances of a country, the economic development of a country, the taxation, the pensions, the education, the health care is all affected. And when you reproduce as quickly as Rwandans are reproducing, it has the highest birth rate in the world, you're, you're going to be impoverished forever. And he had the numbers. And he talked about it's arithmetic. Now, one problem is he's Catholic, and a lot of the people in Rwanda are, are Christians and they're Roman Catholics. So I raised my hand and I said, Minister, how do you get around this problem? And he said, well, we sat down with the Catholic Church and we did a compromise deal. And we said, we do not want you to go into our schools or the Catholic schools and lecture our children that they shouldn't use birth control. Please do not do that. You don't have to say anything. If somebody asks you, give them advice. And the next thing is, he said, all of our hospitals are built by the Catholics, with some born-again Protestants also involved too, but mostly Catholic hospitals. He said, and the Catholic Church agreed, because of our runaway birth rate and our hideous poverty, that the government can build a tiny birth control clinic outside the hospital walls, but right next to the hospital. And I thought, hallelujah, somebody got it. And he's going to do more for the women and children and men of that country than any other leader that I've come across. We have got to, all of us, talk about this. But I'm warning you, the thought police, the brown shirts are vicious. They will kill you 
to protect the sanctity of life. And <laughs> fortunately, they're in the minority, but as they say, for political reasons, I think mostly political reasons, the men who control this world, the uneducated world, like it this way. And it enslaves women and it condemns children. And it condemns countries and society and it's condemning our nature, our environment. I'm real early here, so that's all I have to say. Thank you. So you see what I mean. Why don't we just let her run everything? <laughs> that was wonderful, Thank Diane. You. I, I didn't know any of this background. I simply was looking through some of your work, read a whole bunch of recent columns, picked that one. Well, I just, since we have a little bit of time, yeah. I, 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 one thing, I anecdote I forgot to say was that I was called by the Bill O'Reilly show. And I thought, well, let's get inside that echo chamber, because that's what happens. Bill was on holiday, but Laura Ingram, who's dreadful, was, was behind the mic. So I went to the studio to do the interview. I said, I have to talk to Laura before I go on air. I said, okay, Laura, how, how long is the interview? She said, eight minutes. I said, give me a minute and a half to explain the viewpoint that I have rationally before you mug me. <laughs> and she said, done. And my mail? In my email from that Fox interview of eight minutes, Friday night, prime time, was 200 to one in favor of what I had to say. So when they don't mug you, you can get the point across. I think this crowd agrees. Preaching so to the converted. Thanks a lot. Okay. Okay.